Grace, and welcome again to our worship service this morning. Today is Communion Sunday, so if you have forgotten at home to bring some elements uh, to the table with you, uh, please uh, feel free to go get a cracker and something to drink or whatever it is you desire so that you may participate in our communion. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Good people of the church, lift up your eyes and see. Have you not seen? Have you not heard? Our God greets us here. Good servants of the Most High, open your ears to hear. Have you not seen? Have you not heard? Our God meets us here. Good children of the light, open your hearts and know what it means to delight in God. For we have seen, heard, and known from the beginning to the end. Our God is. Please pray with me our prayer of invocation. Eternal God, creator of the universe, and then some, we call on you. You who greet us here, we give you thanks for making it possible to gather as one, no matter where we are, and to ponder on your eternal mysteries. Make us ready, creatures of this time and space, as collaborators with your endless grace. Fill us, Holy Spirit, with your blessing as we pray all of this together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The scripture reading this morning uh, is from Isaiah 40, verses 21 through 31. I'm reading from the NIV, and this is the scripture that I have chosen in my pastoral message today. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and he spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Our first hymn this morning is Praise the Lord Who Reigns Above.
Our scripture reading uh, for the gospel today is from the book of Mark. I'm reading from chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. And this is the text that our moment for the young at heart and youth is based on today. Jesus and the people in attendance left the synagogue and they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, he took her hand and he helped her up from the bed. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus left the home and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. And Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also, for that is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Do you, by chance, have a cell phone or a smartphone? I don't normally have mine up here in the pulpit with me, but today I have it. It seems like most people nowadays have a cell phone or a smartphone. And as you probably know, it has a built-in battery and it has to be recharged in order to use it. You can't do much with it if the battery runs out, can you? What things do you have that you couldn't use if the battery didn't get recharged? I have to recharge my computer in order to use it and my digital camera if I want to take pictures. In fact, I even have to recharge my toothbrush because it's electric. <laughs> now people need to recharge their batteries too. We work and play hard. And if we don't get enough rest, pretty soon we just don't have enough energy to do the things that we need to do. What happens to us if we don't take time out to recharge? When I don't take time out to recharge my battery, I can get a bit cranky and irritable. I know Nate is at home, right, shaking her head. My muscles can feel weak and tired, even achy sometimes. My thinking isn't as clear as it could be. I might get a bit more emotional than normal. And sometimes I get sick with headaches or flu-like symptoms that I just need to go to bed. Even Jesus had to recharge. In the beginning of our gospel lesson, we learned that Jesus had started his day off in the synagogue where he had been teaching and he healed a man of a demon that possessed him. That in itself took a lot of energy. And upon leaving the synagogue, we're told that they went down to Simon's mother-in-law's house and found her in bed, not feeling well and with a fever. And Jesus immediately went to her bedside and healed her. That took more energy from Jesus's own body. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed in their village. And we're told that Jesus healed many, taking even more of Jesus's energy. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a very long day. By the wee hours of the morning, Jesus got up and he left the house. Now we're not told where he went other than to a solitary place 
alone, away from the crowds of people, away from the new disciples and the other guests that may have been at Simon's mother-in-law's house. Jesus sought a solitary place to be alone, but also to pray, to recharge not only his body, but his spirit. When Simon and the others woke up and they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. Imagine that pressure every day, people seeking to find you. Have you ever just gone off to your room for a much needed rest and had a spouse or a child come knocking at the door, placing their needs above yours? Or maybe you've gone for a quiet drive or a walk just to get away for a bit and the cell phone won't stop ringing. It's not always easy to get away to recharge the battery or to have enough time to recharge fully. See, Jesus, when he took his time in solitary confinement of his own making, he recharged his batteries and then he was ready to go again. And so he said to his disciples, okay, well, let's go to the other towns and villages so that I can preach to them too. That's what I came here for. And so they traveled throughout the region of Galilee and Jesus preached and he healed and he cast out demons. And in order for Jesus to keep on going like the Energizer Bunny, he must have taken time out as he needed to recharge his battery. If Jesus thought it was important for him to recharge his physical and spiritual battery, it's important for us to do the same too. That's why it's so important for us to find that quiet place to rest in Jesus's presence. Why we should spend time in prayer every day to study our Bibles and to come together to worship and learn each week. Is your battery fully recharged? God, help us to remember that just as our bodies must be renewed by proper rest, our spirit must be renewed by spending time with you in prayer, in Bible study, and in worship. We ask for your refreshment. In Jesus' name, amen. have our thresholds, places beyond which it can be so difficult to move. For many of us, generous giving represents such a threshold. Some of us have given in the same way, sometimes even giving the same amount as we did when we were little children. Some of us have never given before. Some of us want to give, but we have no idea how to give. Forgiving takes so many shapes. But like any spiritual discipline, the key is for that gift to grow. We grow in our knowledge of God. We grow in our faith. And if we aren't already, may we not seek to grow in our giving as well? In the time that we give, in the money that we share, in the love that we bring to others. Let us ponder this growth and may God shine God's light across the threshold 
so that nothing can hold us back from this work. Please pray with me the unison prayer of dedication. God of all that is, all we have and all we are, we give. We give these gifts as we reach across the thresholds of our concerns. We give these gifts knowing that they will give us so much more. Through Jesus Christ, we give. Amen. In presenting a speaker before an audience, there's usually a common phrase that the introducer will say, let me introduce you to some and present you to others. Let me introduce you to some and to present to others, so and so. Now this form of introduction acknowledges that the audience has different layers of familiarity with the featured speaker. Some may be meeting them for the very first time, while others may have a history and a familiar acquaintance with the person. In the passage from the book of Isaiah, the prophet assumes that the audience he addresses should know who he is talking about. His words are meant to reveal new truths. Rather, they serve as a reminder of what appear to be the forgotten characteristics of a God who seems distant from the audience. Isaiah comes to proclaim a word of encouragement with an underlining admonishment not to forget what they already know. Now, given the circumstances of the people, they needed a reminder. They had cause for concern and reason to doubt. The Book of Consolation, as the second part of Isaiah has been named, provides a counter message and source of encouragement that circumstances can and will change. By the use of repetitive rhetorical questions, it draws their attention to their forgotten memory and helps reframe the thinking of the people. The intent is not to demand answers of the audience, but to assert the obvious, which is no one can be compared to Yahweh for Yahweh is incomparable. The author, however, does take kind of an argumentative tone. And the defensive aspect of this polemic is because the other side of the issue is all too obvious to the audience. They have good reason to doubt. It's hard to hope beyond our lived experiences. For the Israelites, their captivity was ending and they would be restored in their ancestral and promised home. They were going home to a place of comfort and increased freedom. The Assyrians did not have the Babylonian penchant for exiling conquered foes, a new day before, dawned before them, but hope does not come easily. They need encouragement for the transition and the new reality they will face. And with so many transitions, the moment will not likely meet their expectations. Their memories of home were pre-captivity and the reign of Babylon over their lives. And that world was destroyed. And while much may have been restored, the conditions of the past give way to the reality of the present and the impact of the experience that occurred in between. They need encouragement that they would be restored, but they would also need encouragement to withstand the pains of restoration. I think of our soldiers who were sent off to war, separated from their families, and after months and months and months of a new reality and horrific experiences, 
They come home. They come home with anticipation, but they come home with fear. Fear of what's different, what's changed. We too are a people in transition. <clears throat> Many of us have long memories back to the days when it was the minority of American families who did not associate with the church. When our Sunday school rooms were filled with children, our pews were filled on Sunday morning, the church bustling with activity. And as our country has grown with the immigration of other ethnicities and cultural influences, so has the shape of our nation's religion. We live among those whose pra who practice Eastern religion, such as Hindu and Buddhism, we live among those who practice Middle Eastern faith traditions, such as Judaism and Islam. We are watching some Christian churches grow and flourish and many more shrinking, some even having to close their doors. Some have turned their faces and hearts from organized religion and others haven't bought into it at all. Not everyone has the same memories to draw their hope from. So how does one hope for what they've never experienced? How can one hope for what they can't even envision? The people in captivity lived their whole lives in the shadow of fear. We have many people here in our own nation who live in captivity their whole lives such as the generational cycle of poverty, the lack of adequate nutrition and health care, the injustices of us versus them mentality. How do you foster hope in a people who have lived in hopelessness? What do we proclaim in a world with so much gloom and distress Issues with vaccine supply and distribution continue. Political divisions that did not begin with the ascendancy of one administration are not going to be erased simply by his departure. Economic insecurity and the emotional toll of living in pandemic continue to weigh heavily upon most of us. The end is nearer than it used to be, but its projected arrival is unclear. The people that Isaiah addressed were like weary travelers who had booked a flight long ago only to find its departure perennially delayed. They are now being asked to get ready for boarding and they need assurance that reason for hope has truly arrived. Hope for the Christian people is in the word of God, which does not substitute for human initiative, but supports and strengthens it. The prophet we call Second Isaiah addressed a gloomy and distressed community. What did he proclaim to the captives? The prophet describes God's involvement participation and sovereignty in all of humanity, in all of the world. God's presence in cases and encircles all of creation. The dialogue here in Isaiah is important for it invites the hearers of the prophet's words to consider who God is, and what God has and will do in the lives of God's people. Their God is not distant, indifferent, or uninvolved, but they need to be reminded of that truth. While they are coming through their time of captivity, there will be hard work to do. They will need a hope that will not only get them through until they reach their homeland, they will need a hope that will see them through the rebuilding of what has been lost 
and the reconstruction of a life and a community in a home that will, in many ways, be as foreign to them as their place of exile has been familiar. In order to accomplish that plan, they will need to draw from a communal memory that has been transmitted to them from their ancestors and a vision for the future supplied through the prophet. They haven't gotten there yet. These words before us serve as an announcement that the architect has been engaged. This project is part of a cosmic design that has been carefully crafted by the creator who is still on the job. Now the people have to ready themselves for their role in the construction of their new world. This is where we find ourselves too. As we get closer to this pandemic coming to a close, as we no longer, hopefully, have to socially distance and live in the fear of a live virus hiding in every crevice of our lives, as we begin the reality of relocating back in our churches, resuming our activities as a vibrant church, we must contemplate what that church is going to be and who we will be post pandemic. Most of this passage focuses on the power of God, the manifestation of God and the active presence of God. The last few lines, though, turn the attention to the condition of the people. The earlier assurance reminds them of the majesty of God relative to their existence. The closing remarks assure them on the one hand that it's normal to be affected by the conditions surrounding them, that it's not unusual to have to be reminded of what they should already know. After all, even the youthful and the strong grow weary and weak at some point. Our spiritual batteries need recharging. Our hope may need to be restored. Verse 31 in our Isaiah passage says, But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. We can choose to wait, to trust, and to hope. In these words of Isaiah, the prophet redeems the time that seems to have been lost, squandered, stolen, or wasted. Remember that the pause between chapter 39 and chapter 40 of Isaiah was much longer than a line in a book. Years passed with no prophetic word of encouragement or assurance of presence. And now the prophet says to the people, the time in exile has not been wasted. It was renewing the people for what was to come. The seeming dormancy was in fact a time to recharge and to get their strength back. Going full throttle will exhaust even the young and the strong. But if we embrace the weight with trust and in hope, then we will be restored. We will be made stronger. And the people had to be made stronger and had to be restored before they can return home to rebuild their lives and their church. In this time of exile at home, we too are given the opportunity to embrace that type of weight. Rather than fill every minute with meaningless activity, we should learn how to wait. Not to be patient and passive, but to take advantage of the opportunity that some of us have been given if we will receive it, to slow down and to pause for the purpose of remembering, of renewing, of strengthening, 
and of rebuilding. Let us pray. Almighty God, creator and architect of this world, of our lives, we come before you in this quiet moment to reflect upon the message you have given to us through the words of your prophet Isaiah. As we consider the current experiences of our own lives, let us not be passive and dismissive of others' experiences and reality. We lift before you today all of the people and situations brought before you on our prayer list that they may be touched by your healing spirit in all facets of their needs. We pray for our nation and its leaders, for our churches and its congregations, for our denominations and their leaders, that you would bless us with holy waiting as we pause for the purpose of remembering, renewing, strengthening, and rebuilding. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit's inspiration, with your spirit's hope, with your spirit's trust. Help us to prepare our hearts as we come to your table this morning and receive the gift of your sacrifice, your forgiveness, and your salvation. This, Lord, I pray for your people. Lord Jesus, amen. Please join me in our service of communion. It is right and beautiful and holy that we should gather in ceaseless joy to give our thanks and praise to you, holy and merciful God, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so in grateful procession of endless praise with the church that is, was, and shall be forever, we glorify you joining this unending song. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Amen. Join me in the prayer of confession and assurance of pardon. What do we hold and treasure most? It is the promise of God. What captivates our attention? Is it the grace of God? God of mercy and grace, we are vulnerable people who sometimes ignore the vulnerable. We are broken people who don't always pay attention to the world's brokenness. Heal us, O oh God, to make us better healers. Mend our rips that we might be better builders. Cleanse our hearts so we can clear up the damage of hurt and oppression. We are yours, loving God. Help us to live and to know this better. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Our God lifts us up on eagles' wings, strengthening us so that we won't be weary. The burden of sin is but a far and distant memory, for through Christ, our sins, all of them, are forgiven. 
given of him. Great is God in strength, mighty in power, and full of endless love for us all. Holy are you, eternal one. You sit above, through, within the circle of the earth, setting light into being, casting the stars in the sky, founding the evolving earth and all that dwells within it. Limitless is your power and great is your wisdom. You look upon the lowly as your most cherished creatures. You visit upon the downtrodden with presence, grace, and the promise of eternal justice. You sent to us your own child, Jesus, who reached into unexpected places, calling women beyond the limits of their times, equipping men for nurturing love, welcoming children into your holy embrace. And so we recall that on the night of betrayal and desertion, the light of the Lord, the light of the world, took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in like manner after supper, Jesus took the cup and after giving thanks, gave it to them saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and the many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Life's greatest feast before us. So we excitedly proclaim Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Dear God, you transform. You transform all that is before you so that at the touch of your grace, we are never the same. Dear God, you illumine. You bring light to all peoples, light to the nations, light into our hearts, light on your way. Dear God, we pray for your spirit. Transform, illumine, bless. Make these ordinary gifts of bread and cup into the extraordinary presence of Christ within us. And so doing, hold us as your own. Renew us as your people for the sake of the world you love. For all honor and glory are yours, O oh God, through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit in your glorious creation, both now and forever. Amen and amen. At this time, we will share in the bread. The body of Christ broken for you, that you may have forgiveness for all of your sins. Take and eat in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ. This cup represents the new covenant through Christ, the blood he shed for each of us, that we may see salvation. Take and drink from the cup, the cup of life in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Let us pray together. We have been fed, Holy One, by your presence. We have been led, Eternal One, by your light. May we bask in this glow now and forevermore. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is found in our new century hymnal, but I think it's a tune that you will be familiar with. <clears throat> We yearn our grace for the loose. May God bless and keep you. May God's face shine through yours. And may the glorious trying God protect and keep you all the days long. Amen.